So apparently at an Indian conference you have the speech before the dinner, which I think is a great problem. Because uh, if you have the speech in a UK dinner right at the end, you're either so happy that anything I say is good, or, or so asleep and you're not objecting. Um, so I'm going to have to deal with you while you're awake. Um, and I want to say a few words about INMS, whatever that might mean. But before I'm going to do that, I shall say a few other things. And firstly, I want, of course, to thank the team that has made this possible. Andy is here with her camera at every moment, sending a million emails. Our team is somewhere in the vicinity, uh, and, and, and Sunila and Alison is not here. She's unwell, and Raghuram is multitasking somewhere in the distance. Uh, so we want to thank you guys for making this all possible for Britain. I want to go back a bit in history and a bit further than that, and uh, there seems to be a question about who discovered nitrogen. And uh, if, you, if, you, um, if you believe Harbour Bosch, you know it was discovered in about 1900 or 1910. But in fact, it's clearly much older. Um, much, yeah, much older. So where was nitrogen discovered? Lavoisier. Lavoisier. Okay, that's one answer. So 1774. In fact, it was Priestley. But anyway, pre uh, but um, but no, that's not the case. Um, if you look back and back, you will find that people were dealing with nitrogen much earlier than that. Um, uh, back in the heyday of Indian civilization, I just asked him, actually, when was rice first cultivated? Apparently, six thousand years BC. Um, and um, the point is that things in India are pretty old. In fact, you could make the case for saying that, in fact, the Indian civilization is much older than the Egyptians and the Babylonians. The only problem was you didn't write it down, and therefore you had an oral tradition. And did it really happen? And the other guys get the credit. So with that concept of not writing it down, things have to change. And I'm so pleased that things are changing because you eventually did write it down. And it's here in this book, which we are holding this evening for the first time, yeah. at Tapan in Anchu and others. <laughs> Indian Nitrogen Assessment, uh, finally published 6,000 years late. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, finally published on time, in advance of the next United Nations Environment Assembly meeting yeah, and yeah. the next UNEP meeting, etc. So it's ready, in time, on the table. Um, but we're also hearing about the value of things, the value of the price, the price of nitrogen. And uh, apparently we have 70% subsidy of nitrogen in India, which is pretty good subsidy. Um, but I think this is not the earliest. Um, so India is currently spending $7 billion a year, $7 billion a year on its fertilizer supply, cash cost. But if you go back to some of the earliest records of nitrogen trade, uh, one of the earliest is in the volcano, uh, which was just west of India, um, into Persia, where they were harvesting the uh, sublimate, ammonium chloride sublimate, out of the volcano. They already had a nitrogen tax. In 900 AD, nitrogen tax 20%, if you, if you read those earlier sources. Um, but still, that is not the earliest source. We're even pre-900 AD, way before Lavoisier and Priestley. Um, if you go to the Silk Road, which of course, northern India was the hub of the Silk Road, and you don't necessarily get the documents from India because of the wet soil, you have to go further north into the Tarim Basin, north of Tibet, where it's extremely dry, and then you get the records. So they found, they found an old pair of shoes. It was smelling of ammonia, probably. Um, uh, the old pair of shoes was recycled paper. It was recycled tax records. So you look at the recycled tax records from uh, 600 AD. We're now back further again. And they were selling this, uh, the nitrogen compound, the ammonium chloride, uh, pretty expensive. And it was something like uh, 20 silver coins per kilo of nitrogen. Now, Unfortunately, nobody of you or I quite know what a silver coin would buy you in those days. So I had to translate that into a more useful unit. And unfortunately, my useful unit may sound extremely sexist, uh, but it's the limitations of the data set, um, which was that the price of a slave, and the slave was a female slave. Um, so, but it could be a price of a male slave as well. But six kilograms of nitrogen would buy you a human being. 
600 AD. Amazingly, 300 years later in Egypt, 9 kilograms of nitrogen by your human being. So nitrogen has been a valuable product for a pretty long time. Uh, it's something we should clearly care more about. I don't need to tell you that because you're all here, but the world needs to hear more about that. And it, <coughs> the question is how may that happen? Of course, there's engagement at farmer level, there's engagement in public communications. Then there's this INMS thing. What is INMS? And if you look at nitrogen and all its challenges in agriculture, in waste, in air pollution, water pollution, there is currently no coherent policy approach. Um, so where's the nitrogen convention of the world? It's a bit in the water convention, but in the climate convention, but in the air pollution convention. And it's all a big mess. Um, similarly, there's no, something, no IPCC for nitrogen. And that's what INMS is then aiming to do, is provide a science support system for international nitrogen policy. It's being uh, funded by what's called the Global Environment Facility, that's part of the UN system. It's uh, working together between the United Nations Environment Program and the International Nitrogen Initiative with a five-year program that's now starting and looking toward longer-term sustainability. So what would, the, what would it do? And I think the first thing to say is we're not looking at the IPCC model as exactly the right model. Uh, there's a conclusion that the Climate Convention and IPCC are rather far apart. It's great the work that's done, but there's a need for a closer connection, particularly since the nitrogen challenge is about overcoming the barriers to change, getting policy and science more close together. So we're following more some of the model from the Air Convention or the, what's called the GPA on the marine environment. Um, so that's, that's happening. We're working with that at the moment. It's an opportunity to get involved. There is funding for travel and meetings. There's limited funding for research. But, of course, it's about global network development and spinning up the next phase. So what are the things we're doing? Um, of course, we are learning to provide guidance, learning to look at future scenarios of what might happen, learning to look at what are the options and recording guidance on those options, what could be achieved, and you'll see that in the discussions we have tomorrow as to why we phrase those questions that way. Looking towards providing guidance documents for the UN on, on common approaches for indicators. So we already had this whole discussion about nitrogen use efficiency today, about, uh, about uh, the mitigation techniques, and, uh, and of course the synthesis. So with the Indian nitrogen assessment on the table, the plan is now to provide assessments for each of the other world regions and by 2022, the first global nitrogen assessment. So there's a pretty big and bold ambition, and you're all invited to contribute. And all you have to do is type in the web URL, which is inms.international. Um, so it's hardly difficult to remember, inms.international, um, and you'll find out, and you can get yourself on a web list. So this is an unashamed uh, advertising for this. Uh, my sense is that when we as scientists start talking with policy people from countries, we start off talking different languages. And secondly, when we start talking between countries, we start off with different languages. And eventually, actually, we're all mutually learning and it's changing our research agendas, uh, definitely for the better.